Um, I've called this presentation uh, Restoring the Hotel Del Coronado piece by piece because that's really the approach we've had. Um, this is not a uh, this is not a building that, it, that is like any other. Uh, and we're, we, we make sure we treat it properly and uh, do the right things, even if it's even if it's out of the ordinary. Uh, the Dell is a one of a kind building and uh, it's pretty, pretty exciting uh, type of project to work on. Uh, this uh, graphic you see in the center is actually a, a hard hat sticker that we had made for the construction team that's working on the project um, because they're all very proud of being associated with the hotel. And Swinerton Builders is the general contractor and, uh, and uh, we wanted them and their crew to all have something to remember the project by years to come. Uh, so here is the team for the Dell. Um, of course, the owner of the hotel is uh, BRE. Um, at uh, a Heritage, uh, my firm is the lead architect on the uh, front entry project, as well as a preservation consultant on that project and several others that are going simultaneous and have been recently completed. I mentioned Swinerton Builders is the GC. Uh, of course, we have KPFF. They like lowercase letters, so I, I put, uh, put them in lowercase. Uh, they are a structural engineer, integral part of the team, and you can see uh, MEP, uh, electrical, fire protection, uh, landscape design, interiors, and then the lobby design um, uh, team members, all key components. Uh, I'm going to talk about some other architects that were involved in some of the adjacent buildings as well. But a little bit about the history of the Dell, uh, which is, of course, tied closely to the history of Coronado Island. This is a great photograph, um, the source from the, the book Building the Dream. But this is what Coronado looked like uh, two years before the Dell was built. Uh, not much more than a few small shrubs and a lot of jackrabbits. Um, in fact, Orange Avenue uh, was originally had orange saplings painted all along Orange Avenue when they first created it. But the, uh, the trees never grew because the rabbits ate all of them before they had a chance to mature. So that's why Orange Avenue has no orange trees on it. Blame the rabbits. Um, so here is the uh, is kind of a plot map of the island. Uh, you can see that it was uh, 4,000 acres were sold and they went for $27.50 per acre. You can see this is how the streets are still laid out today for the most part. And of course, the hotel in the lower right being the prominent attraction to bring people to the island, uh, uh, which prior to that had almost no construction on it at all. Now, the design of the Dell was done by the Reed brothers, uh, James and Watson. They were from Indiana. And uh, the hotel reportedly was built mostly from sketches rather than full blown drawings. And that's one of the reasons we don't have drawings to use today. Uh, we rely on photographs to tell us what the building originally looked like. Um, of course, the design was to create uh, outdoor uh, light and ventilation to all the rooms. So there's a, a one acre court, garden court in the center. And uh, originally it was 400 guest rooms. And they had long span column free structures uh, or column free interiors, which I think if you've ever had brunch in the crown room, you've seen that. And the lobby originally was column free at the center as well, but uh, they actually added some columns in later years. Uh, these are some of the early renderings prior to the, the hotel being completed, but you can see the general character is still very much intact, even though a lot of changes have occurred over the years. Um, and then uh, this other rendering is a, a nice view. This is looking at the east and, uh, and north facades. So a couple of construction photos from the original hotel. Um, it's all wood frame. It was reportedly the second largest wood frame building ever constructed in the US. Uh, I think the only larger one was a blimp hanger. Um, and uh, you can see the, the wood studs here, balloon framing as they call it. Uh, this is looking from the north as well. Uh, and uh, all those tents in the foreground, that's where the, uh, the workers uh, lived. So they were, uh, they were lived and worked on site. These uh, photos still come in handy, by the way, to uh, I know Shane and his group and, and Pat have used them and the contractors have used them to look at how the original building was built. Uh, it clues them in on some of the things they might find as they peel away the finishes. Okay. So uh, there's a master plan at the Hotel Dell that was approved, um, you know, more than a decade ago. 
and uh, it includes all these various components. I want to point out the ones that are already completed. The uh, area in green, um, well, actually, I'll talk about the area in orange is where the industrial buildings are that I'm going to talk about. The area in yellow is the main project that we're working on now, which is the front entrance uh, and the, the front drive as well. Uh, and that's currently in construction. We're about 60% along. The, uh, the purple area, which is north of the hotel uh, with a new underground parking garage, that was completed uh, a little, probably about six months ago. Um, the work in the street in green and the South Beach, which is a new conference center and new guest rooms where the surface parking lot used to be. Uh, those are currently in construction. The Ocean Tower is just finishing up. That's uh, one of the later buildings that's being upgraded. And the Cabana Building and the Vista Walk were completed uh, a little while ago, along with some retail improvements. So you can see the Hotel Dell, which is this white area in the middle here, um, uh, is uh, there's a lot of components to the Hotel Dell site. But we're going to be talking mainly about the yellow area and the orange area. So this is a view looking south at the original historical approach to the hotel. Um, the south facade here that you see in the distance is the facade that we're currently restoring. Uh, this includes the, uh, uh, or this view shows the industrial buildings to the right, which was the horse stables, the garage, and the laundry building. And then beyond that was the power powerhouse. Uh, this also shows the railroad tracks that used to uh, bring the, uh, the wealthy guests they could have their own train car and bring it right up to the front of the hotel and uh, and do their stay from that uh, from that point. This photograph is from like you see around 1920 or so. Uh, this is a, a little aerial map, a little more close up, showing of course in red the main hotel building with the one acre courtyard, uh, the port cachere, which is the entry structure extending over the road. And then this is showing the surface parking lot that has been removed and is where the conference center building is now being built. And the front road that's going uh, north is to the, we'll call north to the left, but uh, north is actually to the, uh, <laughs> you can see it's diagonal to the building, but we always consider the water to be west. So uh, north of the building is um, to the left and to the south is a parking lot. And this is where that entry drive is going to be restored. I wanted to point out the relationship of the various industrial buildings. The power plant with the smokestack is the closest to the hotel. It's the oldest. Uh, the ice house and ice storage building and carpenter's shop were next. The laundry building and a storage building, which was a remnant of the stables. And then the Oxford building, which used to be the Oxford Hotel, which I'll talk about. But that just shows you the relationship of the various parts of the site. Now, as part of the master plan, two of the less significant buildings um, that had been heavily altered were removed, uh, which include the ice storage building on the left and the carpenter shop on the right. Uh, my office did a historic American building survey documentation of both of those buildings before they were removed. And we salvaged elements of them, including windows that could be used elsewhere on the site. Uh, this is a uh, the oldest historic photograph of the front of the um, laundry building you can see and then we have the garage and stables beyond that which are now gone. Uh, but that's that's the view of the laundry building and showed us its original appearance. And of course, um, this project that I'm going to talk about the lead architect on it was OBR architecture. Uh, my office was a historical consultant to them and then uh, KPFF was the structural engineer for the, the uh, retrofit. This is what the building looked like from the front, the west side. Um, unfortunately, the brick had been painted. A lot of the windows had been removed. They cut in some vents on the upper level. But this had been the continuously operating laundry building at the site since it was first constructed in the, in the 1920s. And it not only provided the laundry service for the Dell, it provided laundry service for other uh, residents on the island. It was in operation all the way up until 2018 when it was uh, restored and converted which I'll show you shortly. But one of the main things we wanted to do is get that ugly white paint off of the beautiful brick. This is what the interior was looking like when it was still functioning as a laundry uh, facility. It had this big overhead conveying system, where kind of a larger version of what you see at your local uh, dry cleaners, much larger version. And then you could see the character of the structure with the trusses and, the, and the, the monitor skylights and all of the heavy equipment, the wood floors, um, and of course the unreinforced brick walls. Uh, this is what the restored building looks like today. 
you can see the vents up high have been filled in. We got the signage back, new lights. The windows were fully restored. We brought back the divided light transoms and new entry doors, which had been removed years prior. And of course, removing all that paint. Uh, you should never sandblast a brick building or any historic building really, because it damages the surface. So all of the paint was removed uh, using chemical strippers. And this is what the interior of the laundry building looks like. Um, the, you can see on the right, we kept the conveying system, uh, which is a nice um, conversation piece inside the building. It's now used as offices for the construction management team. Uh, you can see there's a little kitchenette over here. Um, the interior was painted, but it was all left exposed. Even the wood floors that you see are the original wood floors. And uh, the two conference rooms you can see have been named Knits and Delicates and Fluff and Fold in honor of the original use of the building. Uh, next building I want to talk about is the power plant, uh, also was called the uh, engine house, which is this building in the foreground. This is, of course, a very old photo. You see a lot of uh, staining on it. But this is when the hotel was first completed or actually in its final stages of completion. The powerhouse was built first because they used it not only to power uh, all the lights and, and the, some of the equipment, but they also uh, fired their own bricks, had their own uh, kilns for um, working with the iron, and they had their own mill shop as well. Uh, so uh, you notice there's two smokestacks here. Those were removed shortly after the hotel was built and the large single smokestack was added later. But this is what the south elevation of that building looked like. And I wanna point out, if you can see, there used to be a uh, balustrade that was a, uh, a, up, up at the parapet, which was a decorative element, which uh, had been missing for many years. This was uh, the lead architect again was OBR with KPFF working as uh, the structural engineers on this. This is what that same facade was looking like after they had removed the ice house that was next door. You can see all of those windows had been filled in with brick or concrete. Uh, and there was a lot of staining and discoloration uh, from the adjacent buildings that were added later. And this is what that facade was looking like in the final stages of restoration. You can see all of the windows, double hung windows have been brought back and that balustrade has been reconstructed uh, on three sides of the building. And we didn't have any drawings or good photographs of that balustrade. So we based the design on a balustrade that we discovered at the main hotel building which was up at the upper level of the courtyard. And this is a present day photo of it. We believe it's original to the building as it shows up in these old photos. And so that was used as the model uh, to replicate the missing balustrade on the powerhouse. Notice this building is painted white. The reason we did that is because the brick was so severely damaged and stained that we couldn't get back to the original red, unfortunately. But we also found that the front of the building, uh, which faces the street, uh, originally had a plaster coating that was painted white. And we found this old ledger from uh, 1887 that notes that on July 11th, they plastered the engine house. So we knew that it was never exposed brick on the main facades. And so what you see here is during all of the bad plaster was removed and was patched. And so what you'll see today is the scored plaster brought back. Everybody liked the look of the red brick, but that's never the way it looked uh, as a completed building. So that's why we, uh, decided to bring back the plaster. And this documentation gave us that uh, justification. This is what the interior, uh, this is also used as offices by hotel staff. It's currently mostly vacant, unfortunately due to COVID, but this shows that a lot of the rustic heavy timbers uh, were left as is, the exposed brick walls on the interior. Uh, the skylights were reframed. They had been roofed over, but they have been, uh, they have been utilized again. And this is at the lower level, uh, offices uh, with the, the, again, the brick exposed. And these arches had been filled in. No one knew they were there until uh, construction started. So uh, it has a really nice character to it now. The last building I wanna talk about before we get to the main hotel uh, is the uh, Oxford building, which is uh, originally was the Oxford Hotel. It was, it's one year older than the Hotel Dell. Um, and it was relocated to this site, which I'll talk about. Uh, the lead designer on this is OBR Architecture and Heritage served as a historical consultant. This is what the uh, Oxford Hotel looked like. Uh, it had already been moved by 1911, uh, and it was a fairly simple building with a single front porch on it, uh, and for whatever reason, it was moved to this location. It used to be near, more near the ferry landing, as I understand it, 
and it was moved from this location in 1986. Uh, they cut the building in two halves, and they uh, and they moved it on Christmas Eve. I guess they figured there'd be, I guess, less traffic. I'm not sure, but the building was moved in 1986 to its current location, which is on the south end of the Dell property, which is right along um, Orange Avenue. Um, in order to try to restore the building back to its original look, my office did paint scrapings, and we found that the current building, which is gray and white, originally had this uh, antique gold on the walls. And then the, all of the window trims was kind of an off-white, this paper lantern color. You can see the original paint discovered here next to the chip in both cases. Uh, and uh, the window sashes, all of the windows have been removed. So um, we chose to, to paint them black, which was a common color for this paint scheme. The upper color you see is the Rookwood Antique Gold that we found. But the Coronado uh, Design Committee decided that they thought it was too gold. And they wanted us to go with a lighter color. So we're, uh, we ended up painting the building, which was just recently done, this lighter shade, which is a similar color, but not, the, not exact. OK, now I want to talk about the main uh, building and the, probably the one you're here for, which is uh, the 1888 Hotel uh, and the restoration of the front facade. As part of the master plan uh, requirements, uh, with the various additions and new buildings and other work on the site, the city of Coronado required uh, ownership to put in um, or to put a lot of that money into restoring the front facade to make it look more historic. Because, uh, and I'll, I'll show you kind of how it evolved over the years and how it doesn't, it didn't look like this anymore when we started the project. But I want to point out this uh, extension. Uh, this was kind of one of the first port cashiers they had. You didn't actually drive under it, but they extended the porch all the way out to the road. This picture, again, is about 1915. This is a, a photograph that we found very useful during the uh, restoration of the building because it shows it in such great detail. This photo was taken in 1910, but the building was uh, still very much in its original condition. Uh, why are all these people out here and on ladders? This was during a fire drill. And so there's all these water pumpers in front and the guys on ladders and uh, the, the, the hoses at the front door. But what this shows us is the original front veranda. It had two separate pairs of stairs. The, the stairs on the right, on the east side, were for uh, basically everyone but single ladies. Single ladies were supposed to use the separate stair that's on the west, and that would bring them right into the ladies' lounge and ladies' billiard room. And uh, so what we had uh, prior to starting this project was just a single entrance into the hotel. We have brought back, or are bringing back, both sets of stairs into the into the front porch or veranda, as we call it, uh, and including these, these nice, uh, very uh, Queen Anne style uh, gables that frame the entries. Um, also note here the stained glass window. This is the, the coronation uh, window, uh, which is an allegorical representation of Coronado. I'll show you a better picture of that, but this was part of the chimney. People usually don't associate windows being in the middle of chimneys, but that was a Victorian detail where they had the flues on either side and they would put uh, stained glass in the center. You can see there was also stained glass at the lower level, which was missing. Uh, and I'll talk about those in a little more detail. This is a great historical view provided by Bruce Coons from Soho of the original front porch. You really get a feel for the character of the space. Uh, you can see the guys in the bowler hats and the rocking chairs, uh, ridge cresting above the roof, um, and just a lot of the detail that had been lost over the years. And then the beautiful railing, which I'll talk about too, which has been missing uh, uh, in many areas of the building. So this is a, a, a great, this is the first color photo I've seen of the building. This is uh, right around the time that Some Like It Hot was filmed at the hotel. But notice how the railings have already changed. They have, they brought it in a zigzag design on the first floor. The second floor railings are still the historic, but they started bringing in zigzag railings. They started adding paint. They softened down the front porch. They added a revolving door and these big picture windows they started putting in. Uh, and they extended the front veranda as well. So, um, one of the reasons I love this is the luggage in front here. This is, this is uh, no one ever thought of putting wheels on, your, on their luggage at this time. And I, <laughs> that's something we all take for granted these days, but um, it's a great, with the women in their poodle skirts and everything, it's a great capture of, of uh, what the Dell looked like in 1950, but showing a lot of the changes that are, had already occurred by that time. So this is what the Dell looked like when we started the project. Um, 
you could see there's no open veranda. It had been filled in. And not only had it been filled in, but the original veranda was about almost 30 feet further back. They had added rooms, mostly for management. And you could see on the right-hand side, they kind of created a false front uh, to make it look like porch posts, but it was basically just staff offices behind it. Uh, and of course, um, they had to have the uh, wheelchair ramp, which we do as well, which was shown here. And these were the brick steps into the one entrance and the port cachere, which was added in 1980, um, which had a stucco lid on it and fluorescent lights. And it didn't really have a Victorian feel to it. It was a very heavy. Um, and so, um, and I also want to point out the stained glass window uh, had been moved from the second floor to the fourth floor and was on display in this in this box um, that was backlit, but that was causing it a lot of harm. And so we're putting it back in its original location as part of this project. This is another view of the way it looked before the start of the project. You can see the, the valet booth, which we've moved. Um, the All of these uh, picture windows that uh, are not original on the upper walls, uh, that are being uh, reversed. Uh, this shows the Port Cachere, and there was the VIP check-in, which was this little photo mat looking building on the on the edge of the uh, of the Port Cachere, which we have moved to the inside of the building. So that is no longer an obstruction to views looking south. Um, one of the things we wanted to also remove from the building is what we uh, what we nicknamed the trailer park, which is they had they had added a new room right in front of the building, right over the main entrance which I'm highlighting in yellow here. It was added in, about in the 1940s. And uh, as you can see, it looks like somebody just parked the trailer on the roof. So we have removed that already. Uh, this is a construction photo from a, a couple months ago. And we are that enables us to restore the building that is behind that, including the stained glass window, which uh, was, was up on the fourth floor and is now gonna be brought back to its location. Hopefully you can see my cursor. I'm pointing to a lot of things during the, the show here. Uh, of course, all the, this building is a national historic landmark, which is the highest level of, of any historic building uh, can attain in the United States. And so uh, we are following the Secretary of the Interior standards for historic buildings. And, uh, and the guidelines not only require you, you maintain what is historic and you try to bring back what's missing, but um, if you're doing new work that's, that was never there historically, it needs to be differentiated uh, from the old, but at the same time, it needs to be compatible. And I will talk about why we've chosen to make some changes and uh, because they meet this standard and this requirement. For instance, the, uh, the disabled access uh, wheelchair ramp uh, needs to be differentiated because it was never a historic element and we can't make it look like it was from 1888. We need to make sure it looks like uh, it's, uh, you know, it's of, of its age. So, the restoration we're doing is not a, a complete restoration because we did not have the ability to remove a lot of critical front offices. And in this case, we had the main computer hub for the whole site in front of the building. But um, you can see in blue is the original outline uh, of the hotel when it was first constructed. And uh, you can see the base of the uh, turret. Uh, the front entry had two pairs of doors, the large fireplace where you saw that chimney. Uh, so what we've done is uh, the building when we started came all the way out to the railing line on the veranda. It was all interior space all the way out to the, the line at the top of the ramp here. And we demoed a lot of those offices. We kept only the critical offices that had to remain. Uh, and we took the original footprint of the veranda and we just reconstructed it about 15 feet forward of where it used to be. That enabled us to maintain those critical functions for the hotel but also recreate the look of the, uh, of the hotel when it was first constructed. And what you see in red here is the, is the footprint of the veranda. It's identical to the way it was in 1888. It's just been recreated further forward. So um, that's the only accommodation we, we had to do in order to keep the building uh, functional. They were okay with removing a hotel room, the trailer park I talked about, but uh, they knew that uh, they needed to keep some critical office and support spaces uh, at the front desk area. This also shows the new uh, wheelchair ramp. It's the zigzag you see here. The reason it's zigzagging is to differentiate it from the original rectilinear uh, design of the veranda. And also 
by doing it this way, it allows us to do planting areas between the different legs of the um, of the ramp, which will help break it up, uh, which you'll see in some of the renderings. But you can see the two sets of stairs uh, that lead up to the veranda, and the yellow is the new wall of the exterior, which has been pushed out further forward uh, for this uh, enable to enable us to do this reconstruction. So this is an early SketchUp rendering my office did um, to show kind of the look of the ramp. Uh, this is the new valet booth, which we've moved over. Um, the, the entranceway has been reversed. You can see the back of a car here. This is the way cars used to approach, but now they're gonna, they're gonna uh, come up to the hotel counterclockwise so you can let your passengers off and they don't have to cross uh, traffic lanes to get to the front door. Uh, and that's the way it was historically as well. This is a new. This shows a new port cachere with the ridge pressing on it, and it shows um, the uh, the ramp with the railing uh, differentiated from the historical railing. And I'll show you some examples of that. This little tent structure over here uh, covers the baggage cart storage. We need to have room to store 30 baggage carts um, for arriving guests, and that's what that is representing. We we push it out of the way. It's not in front of the the front entrance anymore. So uh, I talked about the railing earlier. Uh, we wanted very much so to bring back these historical railings. We had two main problems with doing that uh, that, uh, that were both code related problems. They, first of all, guardrails are required in, in current code to be 42 inches tall, and these were only 29 inches tall. Not only that, but the openings in the railings can only be, they can't be any larger than four inches, and these were up to seven inches. You can see in the in the measurement here of an original railing on the on one of the upper floors. So, uh, and I mentioned their kind of Japanese design influence. Uh, this is I couldn't find uh, one that was closer, but this is a, a a moon bridge, Japanese style moon bridge. It has the mixture of the horizontal and the vertical pickets uh, that the Dell had. Uh, of course, Victorian did borrow a lot of Japanese influenced uh, design uh, in its in its uh, style, but. Uh, the way we decided to deal with this is we wanted to reconstruct the railings exactly as they were uh, and put glass railings behind them. So you can see this is a 42 inch high glass railing. It takes care of the openings issue and it also takes care of the height issue. Uh, this is a photo of the north stairs that have been completed. And, uh, and I will show you another view here, give you an overall view. This is the way the north stairs used to look like. This is the only photo we found of them. Uh, a little bit blurry, but it showed us these large newel posts at the bottom. There were no intermediate newel posts. Uh, and then there was a flat landing uh, to those stairs. And this is the way those stairs looked before we had done this work. This was done in conjunction with the North parking lot uh, project, which I mentioned earlier has been complete. This is what the railing looked like. You, you can see how it did not match that historic photograph. And also the treads were all brick with carpet on top. So this is what the restored stair looks like with the newel posts uh, based on from the photographs and uh, the glass railings behind the historic railings. Uh, and the landing up here allowed us to uh, attach uh, this new, uh, there was no wheelchair ramp at all uh, to the north entrance. And this is now the main entrance to the hotel during construction. So we needed to have, oops, we needed to have access for not only wheelchairs, but luggage carts, um, uh, strollers, people on crutches, anybody that can't use the stairs uh, can use this ramp. And so this work has all been recently completed and it shows uh, the railing that we're gonna be doing uh, on the south entrance as well. As part of that project, they also have a couple small structures that are above the parking garage. This one has a large freight elevator in it and ventilation for the parking garage. It was done in a Victorian character. We kept them as small as possible. And then this building has the elevators, the passenger elevators down to the parking structure. Um, and my office assisted with design of this. And, you know, of course we wanted the red roof and the white walls. And this is what, if you haven't been there lately, this is the, the two story parking structure that is now at the north side of the hotel that allowed them to get rid of the surface parking uh, at the south. So it's really great to get those cars hidden from view. I'm probably going way long here. <laughs> so just a lot to talk about. Um, just briefly, uh, not only are we dealing with the front porch, which you see at the ground level here, we're also replacing a lot of non-historic windows, which you see in purple. Uh, those are all gonna be new windows where, where they have been lost over the years. Uh, and then yellow is showing windows that are either his, are historic or are close to the original design. 
we're actually doing about 20 of those yellow windows. We're replacing those as well. Not the original ones, but the, the non-original ones. So it, all in all, there's about 80 to 90 windows that are being replaced. And we're bringing back a lot of stained glass. We're gonna have about 20 stained glass windows uh, that are part of the restoration project, which I'll talk about. One of the things we noticed in the old photos is the whole building was white, except for, of course, the red roof, which was originally wood painted red. Uh, and now it's a, an, a composition shingle with a red color. But the window sashes were dark. And uh, so we did scrapings. This is a close up of a paint scraping of one of the window sashes. And you could see right above the wood, we had a very dark red. So we realized that all of the original windows on the Dell, uh, the, the only thing other than the roof that was red were the window sashes. And we match it to this uh, Rookwood red, uh, which is a historic color from uh, Sherwin Williams. And so as part of this project, we're gonna be repainting all of the windows on the south facade, uh, the, their historic color, which really makes a nice difference. This is one of the first, this is an original window that's been restored. This was part of a mock-up. I know the color looks a little brighter here because it's in the sunlight, but that's, that's the same color red. And this is a, another window mock-up that was done, a true double hung window with lead counterweights. Uh, 80, those 80 windows I mentioned are gonna be constructed the same way. And these are huge windows. They come down almost all the way to the floor. In fact, on the balconies, they never used to have doors out to people's balconies. The windows were so large, they would just lift the lower sash and walk out through the window. Of course, we can't do that today. So we do have some doors to get people out to their balcony. So this is that beautiful, um, uh, the, the Coronado window that I talked about on the second floor that was part of the chimney. Um, this is what it looked like on the fourth floor. It was moved there in 1995 and had been damaged by the heat. It was kind of in a hot box up there. It's currently being restored by Barra Stained Glass. Um, they're re reassembling and restoring the window. And it's going to be, notice they also turned the window around backwards to forwards. It used to face the interior. Uh, where people could see it. And since they moved it to the, uh, they, when they moved it, it could only be seen from the exterior. So they flipped it around. We're gonna be putting it back and it's gonna look like you see in this historic photograph again. The window was actually designed by one of the, arch the original architect, James Reed. And it's written up in the newspapers at the time. So here's a close up view of it. It has some damage we're needing to repair. Like the arm has a lot of breaks in it and the neck. Um, and there were some patches that were done over the years, like the stock of grain here has a, 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 a non-matching patch. But this is intended, this is the, the woman figure here represents Coronado and she's crowning herself. Of course, Coronado means the crowned one. Uh, and then here we have the seal of California, uh, uh, which is down in the lower part here. So this is really a celebration of, of, of the entire island of Coronado. Um, you can also see in these other black and white photographs where we used to have other stained glass windows, mostly in the transoms um, and in the stairwells. Uh, you can see in these various locations, this is the uh, ladies um, lounge interior view looking out. So we we're able to use these blurry photographs in order to create replicas of those windows. And uh, these are some of the mock-ups or some of the design drawings that have been created with Barra stained glass. Um, uh, picking out the various colors and, and style. We've been working with Bruce Coons from Soho as well. Uh, and this, this is a little bit cartoony because of course it's just colors on paper. But um, of course, when it's glass with light shining behind it, it's gonna be, look a little different, but this gives you a, a general idea of some of the 20 windows that are gonna be brought back. In addition to stained glass windows, we have a lot of historic light fixtures that we discovered uh, that were missing. Uh, this is a, a photo that was taken of a hunting party out in front of the hotel right around 1890. And we're working with Gibson and Gibson Lighting, uh, who are located in Chula Vista, to recreate these uh, hanging lights that appeared in these photographs. Um, we found on eBay <laughs> a, uh, a, a light from England that was uh, similar in many ways to that light fixture uh, that we're using as kind of a model. Uh, Instead of a snowflake motif, we're gonna put a crown motif on these fixtures, but they are going to include colored glass. And, uh, and as you can see, there's gonna be a little bit of a crown motif on the, on the cresting as well. So we don't know exactly what they look like, but we wanna do something that, that feels right and that fits in. Um, you can also see a stained glass window in the background behind it. In addition to that, uh, are those, there's two of those lanterns, one above each entrance. 
we had these uh, wall sconces, and this is a photo from the lobby. Um, uh, these photos are taken at slightly different angles, but um, this is a replica we're having done by another local firm there in Ramona, Kirkman Lighting. They're, they're manufacturing, I believe, 17 of these sconces that are gonna go on the front porch. These are a combination gas electric fixture originally. You can see the gas key on it here. The upper was gas and the lower was electric, so it was a combination fixture. Um, these are gonna be, of course, fully electric. Um, and uh, we are, they're gonna be as close as we can get to match this photo, uh, but they're gonna be a really nice uh, detail uh, that you'll see in the front veranda when it, when it opens up again. Let me check my time here. Okay, 35 minutes. Um, this is, uh, I talked briefly about the lobby. Uh, the lobby project, uh, well, this is a historic image of the lobby showing the original front desk and a little newspaper stand as well, chandelier, and then the, the cage elevator is on the right-hand side. This is looking, of course, down from the mezzanine. Um, notice that there were no columns in the middle, and then compare it to a, a before photo here, these two large columns in the lobby were added in the 1940s. Um, we didn't want to remove them uh, because they, we think they're doing some helpful structural work. Uh, and they were, they were designed in a way that matched the rest of the, of the columns. So they, they will remain. But it shows how much it changed over the years. Um, but one thing we discovered about the lobby is that when you shine a light on it, you discover that a lot of what you think is stained is just brown paint. This beautiful white oak which you could see stripped uh, and the ceiling here during the restoration. Uh, much of it had been painted dark brown. Uh, I don't know, because it was easier or, you know, it was so dark in the lobby, people probably didn't notice. But um, we, we worked and we found many areas of the stairwell and uh, lobby adjacent areas that had the original finish on it, which was more of kind of a golden oak look. And so a lot of the stain that was there when we started the project had a, a reddish tint to it or a brown paint. So they, they stripped almost all of it and they reapplied uh, a new stain and varnish, uh, excuse me, shellac, I should say, over the top. And so this is what the restored uh, ceiling looks like. And you can see the underside of the mezzanine and the railings as well. Uh, this work was actually completed about four or five months ago uh, and it's waiting for the rest of the project to, uh, to be done. But uh, it, 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 it's lighter than the finish, and it's, you can see the wood grain again, which is a, a beautiful thing to see. Um, I want to talk briefly about the bar. Um, this, is, uh, this is a project that was overseen by a, a company called uh, Lahaina Architects. This is what the bar looked like uh, historically. This photo was probably taken in the 30s or 40s, but it shows it had this great canopy over the corner of the bar. Uh, Someone had decided to remove it. And you can see this is a photo taken. It, luckily they had kept it, they put it in storage, but somebody had just chainsawed off these beautiful turned columns and put this thing in storage and, and made the bar completely flat. So part of the restoration of the bar, which was its own separate project. Um, this is what the bar looked like beforehand in, in 2019. You can see it had, uh, the whole back bar was pretty much new. Uh, and uh, the, the canopy was gone and they had TV monitors and mirrors, uh, but the main front part of the bar was still mostly intact. So this is what the restored bar looks like today. Uh, it does have a clear stain on it. It has an, a new stone top. The back was done to more accurately represent the original. No TV monitors anymore. That's a reflection you're seeing there. Um, and then of course the canopy, those, uh, those missing columns were reconstructed from the photograph and the canopy itself was restored and brought back with integral lighting. So if you go into the, you can see the canopy in the distance here, it's at the corner of the bar, the L-shaped bar. So it's open today. Uh, this is one of the parts of the building that is that has been uh, completed and is uh, open to the public again. Um, now I wanna hand it over to uh, KPFF. They're gonna talk briefly about some of the structural challenges with uh, the lobby and, uh, and front veranda. Yeah, so part of this project was opening up the old lobby. You can see the check-in area was kind of all tucked into this corner here and they wanted to get rid of all these columns. And some of these columns are some historic eight by eight solid lumber um, columns that go four or five stories. And we were gonna take them out and replace it with some steel transfer girders to open up the space. 
and doing that's a little bit difficult because typically when you demo, you demo top down. But with this one, since they're staying in, we had to demo from the bottom up. So a lot of complicated shoring work to make sure that the structure above stayed intact while we were doing this work. So um, on the right, you can see in red is these old um, posts that were being removed and, and green is the steel um, columns and beam that we were going to put in. So we were trying to figure out what kind of load is on these posts to determine how we are going to support it. And with no as-built draw lines, it was kind of a challenge to um, determine what was going to be on there. So um, if you go to the next slide, you can see kind of how we determined what was supporting um, these posts are supporting. So we were kind of walking into some of these guest rooms and we walked Sorry. into this, we walked into this one uh, guest room and we saw this kind of funky looking uh, passageway and we we're like, that must be a truss behind here. So we poked a hole in the wall and saw this large four two by 10 diagonal web member and determined this was a floor to floor, 13 foot tall wooden truss that spanned the open lobby space. And, and that's why it was, there were no interior columns. And so that really helped us determine how much load was actually on these columns and how to support this and um, uh, demo it out. You kind of see on the right, a picture of our proposed shoring plan. We were going to kind of bolt through the post with some channels and transfer that out. We also had to work around the railings and all the historic wood finish. So it's a little bit of a uh, pretty simple sketch that we had in the beginning of our uh, planning phase. Um, go to the next page. You kind of see on the left is that shoring starting to come together. Not quite, it's, it's done now, but that's an early photo that I found of uh, the shoring going in. Um, and then on the right, you can see how, how heavy these columns are. It took four people to <laughs> bring that thing down. And when we were cutting it out, the carpenter went through, I think, 15 saw blades trying to cut that thing out. There was so much load on it that it would just burn off and, and, uh, and trap its blade. So it was, uh, there was a lot of load on there. I think it was almost 70,000 pounds that McCalc was on here that we had to resupport. So that was a little bit of the demo, demolition work. And then also throughout the project, it was kind of cool to see when we were peeling back the layers during demolition, finding some of the old original element, you kind of see those raptor tails hanging off the edge there on the original existing wall that was covered up. So when we peeled back there, we saw some of the original finishes and then on the right, some of the original 1888 wood framing that was sandwiched between some added wood that was on an additional balcony. So seeing some things as we peel back the layers, which is pretty cool. But then on the flip side, go to the next slide, there was also some bad things that we, <laughs> we found going through. On the left, you can see all those posts did not have um, posts below. And then actually on the left side of the picture, those, those joists actually cantilever out so they can support those discontinuous posts. But on the right side, where that historic fireplace used to be, the joists used to cantilever over, they used to bear on the fireplace brick and cantilever out to support those posts. And that's why there was no post below. But when they took out that brick fireplace, there was no support added. So those joists were just hanging from the plywood. So we had to um, throw in a new beam and a couple posts and track that load down. So once we opened up the ceiling, we saw those joists were just toenailed to the exterior wall and they were supporting posts above. So I had to make some changes after we opened things up. And then on the right, on the top right, there was an exterior wall kind of bearing just in, be in between those joists and the old floor um, you can see caved in and that exterior wall was actually sagging. So you can see all that, all that uh, TNG broke through. So we had to jack that up, re-level it as much as we can without damaging anything else and, and install a new beam and new wall to kind of fix that. So there's a couple of things we found as we were going through the project. And then of course, on the bottom right, there's plenty of notches and people taking, uh, trying to recess lights throughout the years and changing things up. Thank you, Pat. I'm sure they're they're uh, uh, you know you're going to be available for any structural questions. Which uh, if we have any uh, if we have a, a lab architects on, I'm sure you'll get a few. Uh, KPFF has been great to work with because um, this is an interesting project. I wanted to show this uh, a series of kind of progress photos of kind of where we're. This one is a, a about a few weeks old, but the other ones are were taken yesterday. But this shows the Port Cachere framing, which you can see the main members are steel. These uh, columns are very slender because we're gonna be wrapping them in wood to give them the turned wood kind of look of the original uh, 
architecture. Uh, but this, all of the rest of the structure of the Port Cachero is going to be wood. So KPFF was very creative in where they were able to eliminate the need for steel, uh, but still provide the stability and the strength that was needed uh, for all these components, because we can't build them the same way they built them in 1888. They just will not meet code. And all the new construction needed to meet current code. So as I mentioned, these, the, these remaining photos were taken yesterday, so you're up to date. Um, this is uh, the boom lift there you see is uh, they're restoring some of the existing windows. A lot of the windows on this turret here uh, are the original windows. Um, and, uh, and so they're, they're being restored. You can see the front steps have been roughed in. We have the gable over the entries. We have all these rafter tails. And then here you see the port cachere here prior to it being painted. Actually, this, this photo was taken last week. The next photo, I think, was taken yesterday. Uh, but it shows you the general character and, and how much of the facade is, is currently in being worked on. So these are some of the new posts. They're all uh, Douglas fir that have been worked into place here. Uh, this is on the third floor, actually. We're looking past the second floor. But uh, a lot of these were heavily damaged. We were... I remember the contractor sending me a photo of one of these posts where he was putting a sheet of paper between the, the, the gap in the top and bottom half of the post. They had, it had been fractured and had been displaced and it was no longer performing any structural functions. But, um, and you can see a lot of the windows, these picture windows that are non-historic are starting to come out because we're gonna start bringing in the double hung windows. So this is what the front entrance is looking like now. We have a pair of double doors here with a stained glass transom, a pair of double doors here with a stained glass transom. And then here we have a, there's gonna be a picture window, which was historic and a stained glass transom above that as well. So this is as you come up the main entrance uh, and you can see the exposed uh, structure uh, of, the, uh, of the veranda itself. And the, we, hi, we hid all of the sprinkler pipes, except for when it has to pop out for the head. All of the sprinkler pipes and electrical conduit and speaker wires are hidden in a four inch space we created between the, uh, the beadboard ceiling and the roof shingles. So that enabled us to avoid a lot of that spaghetti that you would see with exposed conduit and piping and give us a much more pure, you know, clean look that you would have seen. This is a view inside of where the new front desk area is going to be. Um, this is some of the, this plywood here is wrapping one of the new steel beams that KPFF had uh, designed. These other two beams are here. Uh, there used to be a steel column that was added in the 40s that was removed. It hasn't been wrapped yet in the finishes, but the coffered ceiling here, this is all original 1888 woodwork that has the clear stain uh, finish on it. And uh, it was all dismantled, labeled, you can see there's still some stickers on it from where it was numbered. And it was all reassembled like a big puzzle. So these first two bays are all the original woodwork. And the second two bays where, the, where it was expanded, this used to be a baggage room uh, you know, prior to uh, the restoration work. That's gonna be, have a similar coffered ceiling in it as well for this front desk area. A few other details I wanna point out. Check my time here again. Um, this is uh, one of the corners of the veranda roof. Um, you can see we have uh, the contractors name these uh, rafter tails the Captain Hook because they have this hook shape to them. And th they were shaped that way to receive the uh, rain gutters, uh, which we're going to be putting back as well. Uh, but they have this unique shape. But you can see they have this diagonal one at, at the corners. And that detail was brought back as well as the beadboard, new beadboard, which was milled to match the original. And you can see where the steel is, is not yet wrapped in wood um, as part of the, the entrance veranda. The, the image on the right shows, this is what the ridge cresting that we're putting back on top of the, the peaks of the roofs. Uh, this is the original historic design. Uh, they originally were wood, but uh, they didn't last too long because they took a lot of abuse from not only insects, but uh, you know the, the moist air and, and dry rot. So we're actually using PVC, polyvinyl chloride um, sheets to have these milled. When this stuff is very dense, very heavy, it's paintable. These will be painted uh, rookwood red, the same as the windows uh, next to the red roof jingles. And uh, uh, this will be a really nice detail to get back on the building for the first time in probably 80 years. Uh, this lower image shows how we've hidden all that sprinkler piping. This is that, what we call the sleeper space. 
where we're hiding all the conduit and sprinkler pipe. You can imagine if this was all exposed to the uh, to the veranda, it would be pretty uh, a lot of clutter. So um, this is prior to them putting the roof roof sheathing down. And then on the right, this shows original columns that were discovered uh, during the demolition. They were actually walled uh, Im embedded in walls when they expanded the rooms outward. Uh, but we we are able to uncover them, and they were still in pretty good condition. So where they where they remain, we're able to reuse them and refinish them. And then adjacent to that, you see two brand new columns that are milled to the exact same dimensions, uh, which are part of the. Uh, this is at the second floor uh, balcony. And my last two slides here um, are uh, renderings that were done prior to the start of the project, but it shows some of the things that you'll see. Um, I talked about the red window sashes. You'll note that we have all of those shown here. It really adds a nice pop of color. Um, all of the historic railing uh, designs have been brought back uh, with glass behind them. You can see a little bit of a reflection of the glass on the first floor. This shows the wheelchair ramp, the zigzag wheelchair ramp that comes down with the planting areas between. Uh, we are using a different picket there because we don't want it to look like it's an original part of the building. So we, we picked just a simple vertical picket, same as we used on the north side. Um, the decking itself, by the way, is going to be teak wood. It's going to be natural teak. Originally, it probably was painted Douglas fir, but the problem with painting soft wood is it gets a lot of dings in it and it all the paint wears away. You have to repaint it every, every year and a half. So we decided to use a hardwood, which is the same wood they use on ocean liners, which is teak. It's more insect resistant and rot resistant. It's more durable and we're not painting it. We're going to let it gray out naturally um, to, uh, to be similar to what the original floor looked like. But you can see the ridge cresting on top of the uh, Port Cachere here, which is a simplified version of the original ridge cresting that was over the two gables. And uh, I've got one more rendering, which shows this is from the veranda showing the teak floor, uh, looking out uh, at the top of the wheelchair ramp. You can see the frameless glass we have behind. Uh, the historic railing, which has been recreated. And then the view looking south, which is going to be, you can actually stand at the top of the stairs of where the front entrance is, look out through the Port Cachere and see the water of Glorietta Bay and even part of the boathouse, the, uh, the Coronado boathouse, which you could not see with all the clutter and the various uh, uh, changes that have been made over the years. So um, the project is slated for completion uh, at the end of June. And, uh, and uh, we're really excited about it. So with that, I want to uh, conclude the presentation and uh, thank everybody for joining us and uh, would love to answer uh, anybody's questions. Uh, I guess they've been written out, so do you, yeah. Yeah, thank you, David. Did you want me to go ahead and read them and, and you guys can answer them? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, okay. So we have eight questions. Let's see if we can get through all of them. Uh, the first one says, what reality capture such as 3D laser scanning used to capture the portions of the hotel that are being worked before the construction phase? Okay, um, we did not use a full 3D laser scan. We basically measured it and photographed it by hand. Um, most of what was there um, was not historic. Um, <laughs> so we, we had to remove a lot of things that were covering over the original structure. So doing a laser scan at that time would not really have shown us what we needed to see. We did have as-builds done that they used laser, laser measuring devices um, to make sure we had all the walls located and windows located correctly, but we did not do any laser scanning just because there was, there was so much uh, alteration that had occurred, we would not have really seen what was useful to us. Well, will the laundry building continue to be used by building management after construction is finished? That's a good question. Um, the laundry building, uh, it, which actually won an ORCID award last year, which we're very happy about, um, it is currently being used by the construction team, but when the master plan work and this $200 million that's being put into all of these various projects, when that money is spent, which is gonna be in another probably year and a half to two years, uh, that building will be converted into a function space for uh, hotel guests and you know private parties, wedding receptions, so it will become a public space and they will move out the office, uh, you know, partitions that they have in there now. What is the plan used for the Oxford building? 
Yeah, the Oxford building uh, over the years has been used by uh, various hotel uh, management and staff. It will continue to be used for that purpose. They are currently uh, redoing the interior. Most of the exterior has been restored now. Uh, it doesn't. It hasn't been brought back exactly the way it looked historically because they tacked on a lot of decorations when they moved it in 1986, and some of those have remained. But we did remove the non-historic porch from the southeast corner, uh, and then we brought back, of course, the historic colors. But it's going to continue to be used by hotel staff. Who is making the replica wood windows? Good question. I actually had it written on the slide, but I forgot to mention it. Uh, San Diego Sash Company. Uh, who do a lot of work uh, in San Diego, especially for old homes. Like if you live in, an, if a, in a historic neighborhood, probably your neighbors have had your windows done by San Diego Sash. And uh, they are fabricating them all to match the originals exactly. And they're working with Spectra, um, uh, who is, uh, San Diego Sash is doing the replica windows, which are new in San Diego, and um, Spectra is restoring the original windows uh, that uh, are damaged or missing pieces. Were any changes made to bring this wooden building up to current fire code? Uh, yeah, uh, the building actually is fully fire sprinkled today. We believe the fire sprinkling was probably one of the first buildings in San Diego to be sprinkled. I think it was around 1910 or 1915. Uh, it has been upgraded in certain areas. We're in our area of work, we're replacing it with new piping uh, because it needs it. You know, they've had uh, failures as you can imagine over the years. We are, not re, um, we are not doing new sprinklers in the areas that are outside of the scope of work, at least not currently, but we are doing new sprinklers. Uh, the, the veranda never had sprinklers, I don't believe. So we are including them as, as part of the project. And of course, fire alarms, uh, everything, everything in, the, in our area is gonna be fully up to code. And the rest of the building, of course, has uh, existing fire alarms and fire sprinklers. What was the most surprising aspect or discovery made while working on the hotel or surrounding buildings? Uh, well, there were several. Um, the, I'm most familiar with, uh, and I think the most of the discoveries we made are on the main building here, and some of them you can see in this photograph. It, most people didn't realize how many stained glass windows there used to be on the building. I, it really takes, you have to zoom in on these photographs to notice I mean, we knew about the big ones and we knew about, of course, the, the uh, coronation window, but we didn't realize that they were almost on, almost on every window across the front porch. And that was not a requirement of the master plan to bring those back. Uh, but the Dell wanted to do it because they loved the idea and they knew it would be the right thing to do. And so they're spending the extra money to have those additional 18 plus windows uh, done. So that was one of the big discoveries. Another one, um, is that the columns on the second floor, hopefully you can see my cursor. Uh, these are the columns that when they expanded the rooms on the second floor, they pushed them all the way out to that, that railing and they were filled in solid with walls. And we didn't realize that not only these columns had survived, but this decorative grill work that you see above, and there's a little more close up view of it here, that grill work had survived as well. So that we're able to, uh, to use the original pieces in those areas. Uh, but most of the rest of it was just confirming what we saw in photographs. Um, and, uh, and then, the, of course, the light fixtures. Um, that was something we didn't really, you could kind of see them here in the photograph. There's one between the two columns. You can see the bottom of it. But you really have to look for them in order to find them. Uh, and then the other one, uh, there's one hanging over in this area as well. So that was something that until we really got into the details of the design, nobody really knew uh, that was part of the original design. Was there existing or old steel structural elements? Yeah, Pat, you wanna take this or Shane? Yeah, uh, there was steel elements we found as we peeled back some of the layers from some of the add-ons, but from a lot of the existing historical stuff, there, there was, uh, it was all wood frame. There were steel components, like there was uh, in the big girder truss, they had like steel tension rods and steel hardware but most of the all original construction was, was wood. Yeah, uh, we found a lot of steel actually that was added in the 1940s uh, when, they, when they changed the configuration of some of the rooms and uh, expanded some spaces. And the last question, um, 
Are the new and restored windows double pane to save energy? Uh, no, they are not. Uh, and the reason is because we would we could never get operating double hung windows with insulated glass. It would be too heavy and it would never fit within the mullion size we were trying to match. So the California Historical Building Code allows for restoration work, allows uh, non energy compliant items to be maintained because uh, windows are one of the first things that gets lost in historic buildings. Uh, and uh, it's very important to keep them where they've survived. And so we not only are bringing back single pane windows, they are gonna be better, uh, ins uh, they're gonna be better insulated through the use of uh, weather stripping, but they are gonna be single pane and we're using the old time glass too. They call it restoration glass, but it has the slight waviness to it. And, uh, and so that will, that will help the new windows, the new restored and reconstructed windows match the remaining original windows. I have one more question. It says, who owns the Hotel Dell? It seems they want to hang on to it for a while. It's a big investment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when you put in $200 million, uh, <laughs> it's a, a BRE, uh, or their um, Blackstone is the B. Uh, they own a lot of hotels. This, this hotel is actually operated by the Hilton Corporation. Uh, they, they do the operations, but ownership is BRE. And they've owned it for... They were part owners for probably at least 15 plus years, but I believe now they're the, if not the sole owner, they're the majority owner. Uh, those are all the questions, David, unless Shane or Pat want to add anything else. I don't have anything else on my chat. Okay. All right, well, um, Looks like we have uh, enough people hung around here. I don't, I don't know what our peak attendance was, but we, uh, I want to thank everybody who was able to attend. It's been, a, it's been a fun project, as you can imagine, and I hope you all can join us for the ribbon cutting uh, that we're going to have. It'll probably be late June, early July. Hopefully, we'll all be uh, vaccinated uh, <laughs> and uh, be able to congregate in public places again, which is what we're all anticipating. Uh, but... Um, and I want to thank all of you for joining us and, uh, and hope you could be there on, uh, uh, and when we reopen. David, I have a question. Is, yeah. the, is the existing, is the old tunnel still operable? The tunnel that went from the laundry area and the Oxford building under to the, under to the, to the main building, is it still, do you still use it? Same? Yeah, there, yeah, there, there is a tunnel uh, that connects between the power plant and, and, the, and the lower level of the hotel near the lobby. That is still there. It's currently being shored up because they don't want to damage it by driving heavy equipment over it. Uh, it's original to the building. And uh, when they do tours at the hotel, they actually take people through it. Or maybe not through it, but to it. But it still opens up into the power plant. So you could, you could stand inside the power plant and look down the full length of the tunnel, which was... It was for employee access, but it was mostly actually to run utilities, uh, steam pipes and, and other uh, other utilities from the power plant to the hotel. But yeah, that will remain. That That's considered an important historic feature. Thank you. All right, did we get all the questions? We did, I double checked just now. So we went through all of them. Uh, thank you, David, so much for leading this tour today. It was so inspiring and educational and everybody loved it. That's all I've been receiving on the chat. We had an attendance of over 80 people. So, and everybody's been hanging out. So we're good. Thank you, Shane. Thank you, Pat, for joining us today. And again, thank you, KPFF, for uh, sponsoring this event. We are so thankful to have you guys are, as our partners. And thank you for all your knowledge as well. Thank you for having us. Thanks, David. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you all right, thanks, everybody. Thanks, thank everyone. You, everybody. Good night. Have a good night.